Chris is right. Uh, we need to restore those cuts and they didn't need to be done. There's a number of areas uh, in the budget uh, or off the budget where we can find that money. One is Medicaid fraud. There's half a billion dollars estimated that we lose to providers and other individuals in the form of Medicaid fraud. Uh, Senator Coster and I uh, worked on legislation that we passed through the Senate, a very strong Medicaid fraud bill trying to recover your tax dollars to pay for this health care. We sent it over to the House six times in a row. They refused to even accept the bill. They wouldn't even let them hand them the bill in the House because the Speaker had decided that he was going to protect their donors who were recipients of this Medicaid fraud money. It's a 40-60 match program, the Medicaid program, but Missouri actually gets a better deal. We buy that insurance for 17 cents on the dollar because of provider taxes that hospitals pay and that pharmacies pay. So we have sent back more than a billion dollars to Washington of your tax dollars that went to Massachusetts, Kansas, Illinois, and other states to expand health care. That is causing a huge problem for our university because now people come to the university hospital for uncompensated care. The other area where we can save that money is the governor wanted to give up to $800 million in tax credits to Bombardier to be able to try to get them to move to Kansas City, which of course they did. $800 million in tax credits. Who was that deal put together by? The governor's sister, who's in the law firm that Kurt works for. That's the problem in Jefferson City, is the people who've been in charge of trying to figure out how to make money for themselves and their friends and their cronies instead of taking care of the poor, the elderly, the disabled, and the indigent of this state in health care. Well, I do, need to, I do need to respond to that now, and I'm sure Ed will have more substance because as the economic professor, uh, he's very knowledgeable on the subject, and I could go into that, I'll let him do that. But, you know, the whole issue about the governor's sister, the governor's sister is an of-counsel attorney in my law firm, a law firm of over 300 lawyers nationwide. So to make the statement that somehow the governor's sister has anything to do with the Bombardier deal is absolutely absurd. But aside from that, I will point out also that Senator Graham again is informed by saying that I oppose a student curator. I have never said that. I said we would have to be very, very cautious on that. It's four years out before we ever need to get to that. I don't think it should be tied to a census change and redistricting. <coughs> so again, but the idea that anyone in this room is going to say that someone else is self-centered and self-serving is the most hypocritical thing I've ever heard. He consistently, year after year, and please look into this, his Missouri Ethics Commission reports he takes more money every year in free food and free gifts, in large part from the university, for his own personal gain. Otherwise, people don't have access to it. So again, for anyone to say that someone else is self-serving is absolutely uh, hypocritical. And uh, on, the, on the Mohila cuts, obviously, the one thing, and I'm a very moderate candidate, okay? The thing about the Mohila cuts, the Republicans don't want to tell you and the Democrats don't want to tell you, the rolls have gone up 20% since 2005. It is equalizing with the new eligibility criteria. People who need to be on are back on, but nobody wants to say that because the Democrats want to make it look draconian and the Republicans don't like the concept that maybe it's welfare. My personal opinion is that if somebody needs to be on care, they need to be on care. The cri eligibility criteria needs to be established that those people in society that otherwise don't have health care should have that coverage. Is that money going to have to come from somewhere? Absolutely, it's going to have to come from somewhere. And the most likely place is probably the university. But we should have a very open public discussion about that, and it should not be done in back rooms. It should be done in the open. It should be a conscious public choice on what we're going to spend that money. It's time for me to work. If you want to see what happens when the state makes bad fiscal policy, you simply need to go back to the period from 1996 through 2004. We put some programs in place in the late 1990s that would be impossible, that people knew would be unsustainable in the long term. And one of those was the state's Medicaid program. They expanded the coverage year after year after year until we got to a point where we no longer could afford it. And you only need to look back at history to 2002 to see what happened the first time we had 
a budget <coughs> crisis. And it wasn't Medicaid that was cut that time. It wasn't K-12 that was cut that time, although they did withhold some funds for K-12. The whipping boy in the past, and what it will be again in the future, is higher education. There's a lot of candidates running around who are making what I would call, uh, they're being less than honest about the ability of the state to restore some of these programs. Whether it's political pandering, I don't know what you want to call it, but the state is absolutely in no position to expand any new program by $300 million at the low end to something closer to six or $700 million at the upper end. Because the only place that that can come from, there's a two, is K-12 and higher education. That's it. And in the past, unfortunately, much to the, to the, you know, the reduction in funds for this particular campus, that money has always come out of higher education. And that's a process that we have to stop. We have to increase the awareness in the state legislature, I agree. But one of the reasons, you know, if you look back over the last several years that we haven't been able to get more credibility and greater resources for this university is that this university has not done a very good job of selling itself. It's only been into the last several years where they actually started to invite legislators up here and actually show them Thank you. the level of, of uh, research that they actually Time think Thank you. Thank you. I will be very quick because we've heard a lot of perspective on this. The one correction that I want to make is these cuts were not necessary. Nobody's hands were forced to make this particular cut. We can't have a budget shortfall. It is constitutionally mandated that we have a balanced budget. So no governor and no legislator adopted a budget that was in the red. It can't happen that way. We have 13 appropriation bills. We make choices. They are difficult choices. The members that are saying that they had to make these cuts are not standing behind the choice that they made. Yes? Lady. Oh, I'm sorry. Rep Everybody else has. I'm not sure. Go oh, right ahead, and then we'll come back to you with your question. Well, you know, I've heard a lot of statements here tonight, and uh, there is one true statement made. Uh, the, the money is available to restore the so-called Medicaid cuts. The only problem is it's in your wallet, it's in your parents' wallets, and in your parents' bosses' wallets. Uh, yeah, uh, my dad has a saying, if you don't ever do anything, you'll probably never make a mistake. Uh, I'm not saying that everything we've done has been good or it's been right, uh, but at the time, it seemed like the best choices to make. Whether or not that is true in the future, that remains to be seen. That's the reason you continue to work, you tr continue to try and look for ways that you can help people in a responsible program. Uh, we had some good legislation, I thought, this year that was going to help increase access to health care. Because quite frankly, if you live in Mexico, Missouri, where I live, there's no doctors that take Medicaid for dental work. There's no doctors that, that will see you except maybe once every two months. So it, it is a problem. We have some ideas out there. We're looking at some new programs. Uh, and hopefully, we'll continue to strive and work to make sure that people have access to health care in a responsible manner with your tax dollars. Thank you. I have a couple of questions here, but we're going to go to a question from the floor, and we'll be alternating. So I hope those of you who haven't prepared one yet or thinking about what you'd like to ask. Yes, sir. Yes, my name is Mark Brooks, and uh, I have a question for Chris Kay. Uh, throughout your career, sir, I have on numerous occasions asked about diversity and what your program and what your plan and what your policy is for diversity, diversity and providing up of mobility for minorities and women, and I have not received a response from you yet. Could you please respond? Actually, Arch, you've got a response every time. You just didn't like the response. Um, I supported very, Ken Jacob used to, um, Ken Jacob was the father of Right Flight, also sponsored a number of uh, minority scholarship programs, all of which I supported. 
Um, in my own hiring practices, when I was county clerk with the Labor Commission, I um, went out of my way to make sure we had a diverse staff. The Human Rights Commission, um, I worked closely with every time we had an opening. I would do that again in the legislature. And um, I'm going to guess that that is one thing up here that, that I think that everybody in this panel tonight is pretty much unanimous about. That the legislature and the state has really, I think, gone out of its way to increase hiring diversity. I don't want to speak for anybody else. But I'm thinking that it's an area where I don't have a single criticism, I think, of the, the current uh, state government. Would anyone else like a two-minute response? Okay. Have a question from the floor for Representative Hobbs. You mentioned in 2006, during another ASUM forum, that ASUM student lobbyists had helped to change your mind about the voting student curator bill. How did you vote on the bill in 2004, and was that vote different from how you voted this year? If so, why? Uh, yes, uh, you know, the, the students at ASUM have done a wonderful job of uh, coming by the office and talking. Uh, the, as I mentioned earlier, the problem I had with this year's legislation is that it was obvious that the curators were having a major meltdown. I had thought earlier in the session that uh, there had been an agreement struck that curators would be supported. Uh, I had assurances from several curators that if the bill was brought back in somewhat different form, and with some more work, there would be something they could agree on. Uh, they did not like uh, the format of if we lose a congressional seat, and that was part of the problem. Uh, I also didn't like the fact that it was only for the University of Missouri. And if it's good for the University of Missouri, why isn't it good for all the other schools in the state? Uh, I assumed that's what the form would be, but no, it was just for the university system. And so I believe that if a bill is brought back that addresses all of the state universities, then uh, I think it would be a much better discussion. And uh, I hope that that would be something I can support. When it's just for the University of Missouri, I felt like it was people were voting for it just because they wanted to punish the university. And I didn't think that was correct. Senator Graham. Let me uh, clarify why it was only the University of Missouri. Uh, over on the Senate side, um, we had Senator Champion and a number of other people uh, in the Education Committee um, that uh, weren't sure whether they wanted to be a part of it. In the past, it was really an opt-in. If a, if a university wanted in, they could be in. If they wanted to opt out, they could be out. And who was in and who was out changed uh, from year to year. What they decided this year was, let's try it at the greatest university in this state. Let's try it at the University of Missouri. And if it works there, then we'll move to replicate it and expand it to other areas. So that's why uh, that was the only one on there. Now also let me address the, the curators. Not one curator testified against this bill in the Senate. Not one curator testified against this bill in the House. The curators didn't take any position until after they had already gotten their budget, and then they came kind of out of the woodwork, and you know, in secret, you know, calling people around the clock, trying to get it done. Why? Because they underestimated you. They didn't believe that you could get 31 votes in the Senate. They didn't think that you could put more than 100 votes on the board in the House, and they didn't think you could get it to the governor's desk. Well, you did, and they shouldn't have underestimated. Representative Hobbs, I, I just don't follow this line of reasoning that what we want at this university, every other university in the state needs to agree to. I don't want to be held back by the other universities in this state. This is a state flagship university. It's the premier public research university in this state, and it is one of the most comprehensive research universities in this country. It is not comparable to other universities, and I don't support a line of reasoning that would make our standard different 
upfront that would keep us from moving forward on the issue because the other universities aren't there yet. Okay. Yes. Um, I guess my question is directed to Mr. Rob, but I hope that some of the board like the way in on it. Give me one second, it's just a little wordy. Um, in each of the last three years, the medical marijuana bill has been introduced in our state legislature. And while the bill has gained an increasing amount of sponsors and co-sponsors, it is only gained one from the union that has never reached the floor vote. Realizing that 70% of Columbia voters supported the medical marijuana bill that passed at the municipal level in 2004, a recent AARP poll conducted in 2005 showed that 77% of adults aged 45 and older 